Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today, I actually have three different guests who are going to speak about student loans and about organizing against student loan debt. On the show today, I have Lucy. Hey, Lucy. Hi. And then I also have the Bank Sisters. Hello. Hi. So thank you, everybody, for, for joining me today. I think this is a really important issue to talk about and how it also affects other issues as well. Um, but before we get started, I just would like everybody to be uh, familiar with everybody's background. So uh, Lucy, how did you first get involved uh, in politics and also with the, the issue of student loan debt? So um, I actually, well, I have student loan debt. And um, I think one of the first things to do was to just like try to join other people's efforts organizing um, against student loan debt. Um, I joined a bunch of like Facebook pages and um, I joined uh, several of them. I joined one called Forgive Student Loan Debt, um, Student Loan Crisis. Um, I joined Debt, Debt Collective. And then I realized that all of these different organizations have problems. Um, and then, um, so <laughs> I can talk about that further. Um, but aside from that, I actually, um, just decided to start making videos one day. And that's how I met the Bank Sisters. Um, and uh, I just started meeting people on Twitter and on YouTube. And um, I have a small YouTube channel called Blue Moon Red Wine, um, which I've actually like put on hold a bit in order to be able to organize a little bit more. And that's how I hooked up with all of these beautiful people here. Wonderful. So uh, Courtney and Keisha, could you just go over your own background again? How did you get involved uh, with politics generally and then also specifically with the issue of student loans? Yeah, um, so I'm Courtney. This Keisha. I'm Keisha. Uh, hey, we're about eight years apart and we, um, we started living together in Los Angeles and we were working, you know, two jobs um, and I was working three jobs. And then when the pandemic hit, um, you know, we were just sitting around a lot talking to each other about things. And we just mm -hmm. felt like a black female voices were important. So we kind of started getting more generally, like specifically involved in politics. But I think the thing that has always interested me is how everything is interconnected. And so with student loan debt, um, I personally don't have any student loan debt, but I'm on Medicaid, right? So I could, we could have better doctors, you know, who could actually help out people who can't afford, you know, can't afford a lot of healthcare um, to help us out, or we've faced eviction before, and right. there are almost no tenants' rights lawyers at all. There are hardly any, yeah. and there'd be a lot more people who could help with other issues um, if they didn't, if they weren't saddled completely with student loan debt. So it's very interesting how everything is, is so interconnected to me. It's not just about, you know, <laughs> helping somebody just go to somewhere yeah. for free. It really helps our society. So I love looking at it that way. Yeah, and technically we might not like, I don't technically have any more student loan debt, but our parents helped us out a lot. And, you know, that has just rolled over into the mortgage on our house. So, I mean, we do still have student loan debt, it's just not called student loan debt. So um, I think there are quite a few people in that situation as well. And I, yeah, we just have to understand how everything works together. So uh, Lucy, one thing that I kind of keep wondering about in terms of uh, how the Democratic Party is managing this issue is that uh, we haven't had student loan payments for two years now, right? Since since the start of COVID, and um, you know they keep kind of like kicking the can, but like not actually like uh, like doing anything substantial about relieving it. We get kind of hints that it's going to happen at some point. Um, and something that I guess was confusing me recently was the fact that they extended the payments from the payment pause from May first to September first, which is just right before the midterms. So that seems to suggest to me either that they're going to be doing some kind of forgiveness or that they just want to extend it again right before the midterms in order to like have people you know think favorably of the party. Um, but it, again, it seems just a, a little odd or a little questionable to me. What, what are your theories on why they have continuously extended the payments and why they extended it specifically to September 1st? Um, yes, okay, so that's a great question, Primo. Um, I knew you would come with all the great questions. <laughs> Um, because I love your show, by the way. But anyway, um, uh, I th I personally think um, after like being a student debtor um, for people that aren't student debtors, I think one of the best ways to understand the student debt crisis is that it's sort of like the housing crisis. Like even if you're not personally affected, um, it is basically the center of a bubble um, that affects the entire economy. So for example, I personally wasn't affected by the housing crisis um, because I, I didn't own a home. 
right? So I didn't lose my house during the housing crisis. However, I was still affected by the housing crisis because when people started getting laid off during the housing crisis, they started to give the like entry level jobs to um, real like, you know, older professionals that had lost their jobs. So there were like no entry level jobs really when I graduated and I was trying to get a job. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it didn't affect me directly in the sense that I didn't lose my house but it did affect me indirectly in that a lot of those people that were getting laid off um, during the housing crash uh, took the jobs, like the entry level jobs that were basically supposed to, like my generation was supposed to get. Um, and the student loan issue is, is very, very similar. Um, it's a huge financial, it's like the center point of a huge financial crisis. So um, the reason that I think that they, they keep extending and extending ex and extending is basically because they know that if student loan payments restart, like if there's like a specific date that they restart, um, I do think that people would, would, it's a possibility that people would come out in droves on that day to demand um, that they be canceled. And they're very, very skilled at um, kind of neutralizing opposition. One of their strategies and I can say this for sure because um, I've actually seen this in action. Um, like back in January, um, student loan payments were supposed to start, to restart. And the debt collective, which by the way has its flaws, um, but they were actually trying to start um, uh, like huge protests um, that were scheduled for January, right? Um, but then there was a loan extension and the organizers kind of got demotivated, people stopped joining the action and all of that energy kind of dissipated. And then they postponed it to a later date. So this is one of the reasons that they keep extending those dates because they want to kind of neutralize and like take away the energy of all of these activist movements. Um, the second reason is because they want to virtue signal. It really helps the Democrats to extend the payments and you know e probably up until the day the midterms happens and they can maybe even make their payments restart um like three days before uh they lose the midterms because they're probably going to lose the midterms and um they can always say look the republicans did it <laughs> you know like people have very short term memory uh even if um the the democrats take away uh, like restart um, loan payments three days before midterms, they can just say like, oh, the Republicans did it. People won't really, like they don't really look at the details and they won't know if it's the Republicans or the Democrats that, that basically restarted the payments. So they're probably gonna find some kind of shifty way, in my opinion, <laughs> to re have the payments restart maybe right before midterms as they're, um, virtue signaling this entire time about how they're going to cancel student debt. That's what I think is going to happen, but you know, we can always like wait six months and see how it plays out. And I don't want to spend uh, too much time talking about partisan politics, but um, just the other side of the coin that I, I also wonder about, and Courtney and Keisha, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but um, it, it seems odd to me that given a how bad the, the economy is doing overall, right? Like gas prices are at all time highs, uh, food prices are, are rising, you have the baby formula shortage, you have inflation, you have interest rates, you have the, the stock market, um, you know, pretty much crashing, going down 4,000 points in the last three weeks. Uh, given all of that happening, it's strange to me that, um, you know, the only, the only thing that, that Democrats really might have going for them is student loan forgiveness, but they're, they're not really running on that per se. Again, like we're, they're just kind of like kicking the can or like, um, you know, tweeting at Joe Biden to do something. But on the other side of the coin, it seems silly that the Republicans also seem to be running against student loan forgiveness. And they've been very vocal about that, uh, criticizing the idea, again, like calling it socialism as, as they want to do. Um, and then also with that, like recently with abortion, like trying to uh, overturn Roe versus Wade, like right before the midterms, which just seems to put wind behind the sails of the Democrats. So uh, just wondering if what your thoughts are on that overall on the midterms just it, again it seems as though both parties are kind of like st striving to outdo each other in terms of, of being bad and alienating voters totally true i mean 
the biggest thing for the Republicans is personal responsibility, yep. you know, at, <laughs> at all, at all times. So it doesn't matter, you know, if you didn't finish college because, you know, your husband died or because, you know, like not, none of it matters. Like everything for them has to do with personal responsibility and it goes to every, so if they were to even, you know, for them, it could be smart to take up the idea of student loan debt cancellation, but they would just never do that because it would erode at their their whole ethos. Yeah, that's a, that's a big part of their branding. They love to be <laughs> behind that. I think what we're seeing from both parties is they're kind of trying to figure out what's going to motivate voters the most. Like I think for Democrats, they're having the most difficult time because Republicans always seem to come from the offensive and Democrats are always playing defense. And in this situation, Joe Biden could erase student debt. I mean, right. he could just do that. And that would be a winning thing, I think, motivating a lot of the younger voters that he had before who he's completely lost. Um, I mean, the same thing with maybe like descheduling marijuana or, mm -hmm. you know, expunging some records or things that he could do to actually win over people. But it doesn't seem like the Democrats actually want to make a stance on anything like with Roe versus Wade. I mean, there's a lot of things where it just seems like they, they need because, because I mean, at the end of the day, they tend to legislate a lot like the Republicans. So it, it seems like they know that we're getting smart and hit to it. And I just don't know how much longer this game is going to be able to last, you know, because as you said, you know, it's been two years that people haven't been paying student loans. You know, I think right. everything, it, everything else has been happening on its own. It hasn't because wages has gone up. It hasn't been because, you know, people finally got paid family leave. No, it's none of those things. So it wouldn't affect anything to erase that. And it just seems like they're playing political games and not completely at all you know, concerned about real people's lives. And again, I just wonder in the backdrop of the economy, because, um, you know, assuming that assuming that the economy isn't collapsing currently, uh, if they were to have student loan payments resume, um, and even if that's, you know, just for some people, it, you know, there, there's 45 million people in the U.S. currently with student loan debt. And if you have them effectively making an additional mortgage payment every, every month after two years of not doing that, it seems as though that would definitely crash the economy. And that's what I, I think a lot of people... Um, who may be opposed to the idea of student loan debt don't really understand is that, you know, we're, as Lucy was saying, it's not just specifically about you, if you have student loan debt or not, it's that people cannot make their student loan payments. People can, will not be able to pay back that debt. And if you, uh, if you don't forgive it and try to, to force them to, they're still not going to be able to, you're still probably going to get forgiveness or, or, you know, it'll, it'll uh, need to be resolved somehow but you're gonna end up crashing the economy along the way as, as well. It's weird that capitalists don't want people to participate in capitalism. Right, I mean, <laughs> people would have more money if they didn't have to. And it's, I mean, because a lot of, you know, the schools have been subsidized by the government and I mean, just like corporations are. So no, like no harm, no foul if, if we, if people didn't have to pay back their student loan debts and it's gonna throw us into, uh, that's a great point that you make because people who, are thinking poorly about this had just not even thought about the ripple effects of the economy at all. And the reality I mean, of like the actual interest rates, it's compare, you can't mm -hmm. even compare it to how it used to be even a few years ago. It just, mm -hmm. even if you wipe out $10,000, right. that really doesn't do anything for anybody because the interest will stack just, up so quickly. Um, so it is interesting that, that you can't even win people over from this other angle. Like, don't you want people to participate more in capitalism and have a more hearty and robust economy? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I, I, I agree with um, Courtney and Keisha, and I also wanted to add that um, they've actually been pretty successful at kind of making this a partisan issue. Um, Alan Collins, um, the founder of Student Loan Justice, if you want to interview him in the future, he's very good at talking about how they've done this. Um, but basically, um, they've tried to make uh, student loan debtors to be out um, to be like they've kind of made them out to be rich kids that are trying to get some kind of federal bailout. Um, first of all, like when I worked on Hurricane Sandy, for example, um, there were people uh, that had beachfront homes that got bailed out by the government, um, people that own $500,000 homes. Um, so these kinds of economic bailouts are not actually that rare in our country. It's just that they're trying to make it a partisan issue, you know, um, because basically what's going on is um, they don't want to lose um, their young Republican voters. Um, and uh, they want to make sure um, that people stay on, in that party as well. Um, one of the things that they've, they've almost always failed to mention because they know that it would sell with Republicans is the fact that Joe Biden removed bankruptcy protections 
um, from student loans. And that's mm -hmm. actually one of our original constitutional rights. So if you frame it in that way, um, a lot of Republicans would start thinking about this differently. Um, we need at like the very minimum, the return of bankruptcy rights to student loans. That's what's going to force all change. And um, if you go to student loan justice, there's like information about that and about how you can like call your reps or whatever and talk about pressure them to return um, bankruptcy protections. The other thing that's no one says because they know that it would make like everybody hip to their basically game um, on splitting people up along this party divide is that red states, people in red states actually have way more student debt than people in blue states. Sure. I live in New York and I have a lot loads of student debt. So it's not like people in blue states don't have student debt as well. Um, but people in red states are hugely affected. And there's actually data that that um, the people that student debt um, in Georgia, for example, is greater than the state budget of Georgia. And this is not uncommon. So like basically um, this is an issue that can actually that will actually bankrupt red states. Um, and if people in red states don't actually stand up to um, student loan debt, they're going to be, um, you know, they're, they're basically screwed. Like, <laughs> so um, this is, uh, it's a constitutional issue. It's a state's rights issue. Um, and the way that they've been talking about it, and this is on purpose, by the way, um, and it's one of the things that I actually um, have, I don't, I, I don't think they're doing it on purpose because I, I do think that a lot of people that are affected by student loan debt are Democrats, are liberals, et cetera. Um, but, um, a lot of the organizations, um, have tried, have like continued this game of presenting student loan debt as kind of a blue state issue. And some of the organizations that kind of do this, um, are organizations like student, student loan crisis. That's an organization that Natalia Abrams funded. And I think that, she, uh, she, she founded it. And I think that she wanted to work for Elizabeth Warren. And then there's, um, Debt Collective. Um, Debt Collective is a great organization and, and like kudos to them because they actually still have actions on the issue. But one of the things that they keep doing is they keep retweeting the squad and like, you know, members of Congress that are kind of virtue signaling about how they're going to cancel student loan debt um, without actually doing it, anything. Or they'll have like the debt union and they'll, uh, so, you know, like somebody on their account will start talking about Roe v. Wade look, if you want to support Roe v. Wade, by all means do so, you know? Um, but the problem when you're trying to make a union with people from different political parties or political affiliations that have debt, right? Um, and, and then you have all of these like um, kind of liberals and, you know, um, Democrat or like people, you know, start talking about other issues that not everyone agrees with that's also a strategy that they use to break up these organizing efforts. So at some point, like we have to kind of come together and do some kind of action, understanding that a lot of these organizations have either been co-opted or even if they're not co-opted, they don't really have like a good uniting message. Um, and just say, look, this is not like a blue state thing or a red state thing. Our economy is crashing. We have a lot of student debt. The, the like our student loan crisis is bigger than the state budget of like several red states <laughs> and blue states. Um, and it's just, this is out of control. Like we have to put a stop to it. And um, we've lost like one of our major constitutional rights by losing our right, right to bankruptcy. So I think we kind of need to have a more uniting message than what's going on right now with, um, you know, like these politicians making cancel student debt into this partisan issue. Well, I think there have been some fringe cases of uh, people student loan debt getting dis uh, discharged in bankruptcy court, right? Like, I know it's not common, but I believe that there were a handful of examples of that. Yeah, there might be a handful, but I myself have filed for bankruptcy and I used to be on, um, I used a system called Upsol, which is very good if you want to file for bankruptcy for free and do your own paperwork. Um, but um, on, they, we also had like a little Facebook group, you know, just like asking each other for help. And I mean, it was shocking how many people had kind of gotten through the process, like halfway through the process and didn't even realize that they couldn't put their student loan debt 
on their bankruptcy. So I think, um, you know, there might be a few anecdotes here and there of people that have been able to um, get it passed or, you know, maybe if you, you know, took out a different kind of loan, but use it to pay for school, then you can do it that way. Um, but for the most part, I think a lot of people don't even realize that, you know, Biden made this law way back in the day and totally screwed us all. I mean, and I think uh, Lucy makes a really good point too about bailouts. I think that, you know, just as individuals, we have to really start thinking about the unfairness of how many times corporations and other, you know, people with houses get, you know, bailouts and subsidies and, you know, we get nothing. Right, right. Yeah, every time it seems as though there's uh, any kind of suggestion for any kind of welfare program, uh, it's it's always, we don't have money for that. But there's right. always money for corporate welfare. There's always money for war. That's it just, uh, it's it's funny with the dichotomy there. Like they never question where the money will, will come from when they're sending $40 billion to Ukraine. It's always, you know, yeah. when it's uh, like any kind of student loan forgiveness or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, uh, you know, what the government has been doing the last couple of years, I'm just curious if, I'm just curious if uh, anybody thinks that, you know, what they're currently doing may just keep on happening forever. And if that's necessarily a bad thing, like if the government does just keep kicking it, you know, three, six months, a year down the line uh, and extending the pause forever. I mean, isn't that effectively a form of student loan forgiveness, um, especially with, with inflation the way it is? I mean, that's, and with, uh, you know, the, the interest rates being paused as well, because the uh, value of the dollar is going down, the value of the debt that people hold is also effectively going down. So um, I know that's not really like a best case scenario and it's still like on people's credit reports and whatnot, but like, isn't it, could it be thought of as somewhat sufficient if the, the debt just keeps getting paused and that pause keeps getting extended over time? No, you know, it's <laughs> no, no, people need to unequivocally, they need to, I mean, because everything else is, is, is being affected by inflation. I mean, the housing market, um, it's just becoming untenable to even survive in America. Um, you know, we had to move into our parents' basement. So like, well, that's the state of, of the world. And it's just like, people need unequivocally to know that they are safe and steady in this one area. And politicians have ran on it on so much. I think people are sick of being tokens and used, you know, for every election cycle. And I think, you know, to say that that's some form of forgiveness, I've also heard that one reason they haven't um, gone through with uh, starting back up the repayments is because they haven't actually had the infrastructure in place to, to do that again. Like somehow the Trump's administration messed it up. So it's almost a benefit to them right now that they're figuring things out. And I don't know how much they're actually being kind well yeah and then and it just makes me a little nervous because you know if you've been following evictions you know a lot of people that got their you know that um had like a hold on their um uh, paying their rent are now it's just added on to the back end so you know yeah that money doesn't doesn't really go away and you're still yeah definitely in the same situation especially mentally so I don't know if that would help but lucy yeah and the other thing is that like it's basically locking an entire generation out of the housing market if it's not completely forgiven. Um, and um, for the people that are, you know, whose entire families have been poor in the past or people that have like no intergenerational wealth, people that can't just like inherit a home, it's going to really, um, the student loan issue will really lock kind of, um, it, like class mobility will be over in this country if, 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 if they don't do something about this. So, you know, um, one or two generations ago, in spite even of the racial divisions of this country, like I've heard date people, I, like I'm not an expert on this, but I've heard people say data that there was actually more um, class mobility and kind of um, racial mobility in terms of um, more black people becoming middle class in the 1960s and 70s than today. So this is, this is a big class issue it's a, it's like a big racial issue. Um, it's, it's locking people out of the housing market and, um, you know, uh, th they're going to have to do something about it. Like this is not an option. And if you can't, um, by, by the way, like I, I had an experience with this. I had so much student loan debt that I couldn't get a mortgage. I was completely locked out of getting a mortgage. And somehow I basically like came into an agreement with my mom and I, I, I lived on her couch for like five years in like my thirties. And I saved up cash. And that's that's how I managed to um, like have the apartment that I have now. But it was extremely difficult because I couldn't get a loan from the bank. Um, so um, this is not um, th this is not 
tenable <laughs> as a society for people to not be able to get a mortgage. You know, it's great for, you know, like if you're lucky enough to be able to inherit a home, that's great. Or if you're lucky enough, like Keisha said, that, you know, they, they had, they, I, I, that you said that it's like on your mortgage or something. Yeah, my parents, yeah, they basically just, you know, refinance their house and then use that to right. pay so we'll so, have to pay off the house. Right. Yeah. So we're still paying it off. Yeah. So like, this is like a, like a strategy uh, that they have for actually taking over people's property. Think about it. Like they uh, make people put their houses as collateral for their kids going to college. What's the end of result of this? Basically like the banks, the 1% are going to have an ownership share in your family home. Um, this is not okay for, for, um, for people to have to mortgage out their homes in order for their kids to go to college. Um, so like they're basically dipping into generations of wealth and extracting that from the middle class. And it's, 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 it's not okay. It's like, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, right. You're to so dead on our parents, yeah. but like our parents, like went to, you know, one year, two years of college or something, and they were able to buy our house and for eighty thousand dollars, and the house next door is selling for five hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something. Like I don't even. And there's also some statistic about a lot of black college graduates also um, like regretting going to college or doing um, worse than their um, their parents as well. I mean, so it's you've got people trying to better themselves, but then it seems like everything else is stacked against them. So yeah, especially with what you're saying about credit scores, which screw you every which way. Um, definitely. It would be good to not have that burden on you. So Lucy, you mentioned that these organizations are somewhat co-opted that are pushing for uh, student loan relief. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned back in January how they were organizing some protests and then stop. Um, I did see actually some protests because they waited so long the last time, right, before they extended the May 1st deadline to September 1st. Uh, there were some protests I saw, uh, I think, in like mid-April or early April. Um, so it, it seems as though there have has been some organizing, but I, I agree with you where you know there's a lot of democratic politicians out there who just keep tweeting at the president as opposed to you know like introducing any kind of legislation to force the issue. Um, so just curious if you kind of go into a little more detail on, on how exactly you think these organizations are co-opted. Yeah, so this is gonna go into another discussion about um, like how basically we need to kind of relearn how to organize without being so dependent on these nonprofit organizations, um, which probably the Bank Sisters will go into um, when they talk about Camp Dada. But basically what part of the problem is, is that um, we have this mentality that like, it's like, oh, there's gonna be an action. What website do I sign on? <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Um, uh, you know, people have the need to like have an official organizer. So um, part of the problem with that is that it is really hard to organize on your own, right? Um, and uh, I understand that. But the problem is that a lot of these organizations get co-opted by the Democratic Party, or they just don't realize it, but they don't have a very uniting message. Um, one of the first Facebook groups I joined um, regarding this issue alone was called um, Forgive Student Debt. It was like a Facebook page that um, older organizers had started. And basically what happened is that um, Mark Zuckerberg actually shut that Facebook page down um, during the Obama era. Um, he was actually friends with Obama. He like lived close by in Hawaii and they orchestrated the whole thing. This is actually what I heard from um, the, the organizers um, that worked on that page. And then what happened is that um, there's a lot of services that you can sell to student loan debtors, right? There's like um, refinancing. So the people that were kind of like selling these refinancing deals um, and kind of infiltrated the page and they started using the page, the organizing page to um, advertise refinancing. And there's a higher default rate on refinancing than there actually is if you just leave uh, your student loans um, as federal loans. So um, you know, there, there's like a lot of problematics here. They also had a lawyer that kind of just kind of used it to sell legal services. So that's what happened with Forgive Student Loans. Um, then there was another organization called Student Loan Crisis, um, headed by Natalia Abrams. Um, I'm not friends with a lot of these people, so that's why like I feel comfortable just saying <laughs> whatever I want. Um, it was kind of another generation of organizers, right? But she uh, was kind of involved with 
bringing Elizabeth Warren into uh, supporting student loans. Um, the problem is that Elizabeth Warren was actually extremely problematic for the student loan movement. First of all, because she was the one that introduced this idea of caps on forgiveness. Um, caps on forgiveness are really terrible because the problem is that it helps some people out and not others. What she was able to actually effectively do was to get the grad students on board and really um, separate them, like divide the vote of the progressive movement um, between the people that had a little bit of student debt and the people that really it's a huge issue for um, where they won't be able to pay it off with a $50,000 cap and um, you know they'll never be able to afford a home, like those kinds of people. So she was able to split the progressive movement. And then um, one of the head, the head organizer of student debt crisis, her name is Natalia Abrams, um, she wanted to work for Warren at the end of the day. So like, yes, she, I think she started off with like genuine, genuinely caring about student loan debt, but then she kind of used it to, um, you know, ingratiate herself with the Warren campaign because she wanted to work. She, she wanted a job, right? So that's, that's what happened there. And then um, with Debt Collective, what I'm seeing is that um, they are probably like the only organization that um, actively organizes right now, which is great. Um, they, they hold meetings, but they only have actions in DC, right? And a lot of their actions are infiltrated by Democratic politicians. Like they had like Nina Turner show up. You know, I, you know, like, I guess, you know, a lot of people prefer Nina Turner to other politicians, but she still hasn't done anything on student debt cancellation, right? She hasn't been effective. Um, they'll tweet out Democratic politicians just for saying something. This is the problem. Like the standards are so low right now that we reward politicians just for saying they're going to do something, not for actually doing it. So these people, like these organizations, unfortunately, and you know, I've I've met a lot of them, and I do think that like a lot of the organizations they they come from it with a good heart, like the organizers, but they don't realize that um, retweeting Democratic politicians will probably, you know, not be a game changer in terms of attracting independents and Republicans, first of all. And second of all, um, you know, even if that's not your primary goal, it's not going to be the best thing that you can do in terms of actually holding these politicians' feet to the fire. Because if you're just rewarding them with free advertising on your page and on your website and on your Twitter with free advertising, and these politicians aren't actually doing anything for you, then politicians ultimately, they're going to know that you're going to use your movement to advertise for their campaigns for free. And that's not that's just not the way that, that you're going to get anything done. So I've kind of backed off of all of these nonprofits, except for one. Um, which is called uh, Student Loan Justice. And it's actually just like one guy um, running it. Um, and he doesn't have the energy. He's like, he's been doing it for 20 years um, uh, to, to actually hold actions every day. Um, but I know that he's not corrupted because he ended up abandoning, abandoning all of the other organizations. So all of these nonprofits are ultimately a little bit um, either co-opted or they are really not successful, basically, at having a uniting message and holding these politicians' feet to the fire, which is why we kind of have to figure out another way among each other. Like, even if we don't think of ourselves as student debt activists, we have to start thinking about what we can do independently without them. And honestly, that kind of reminds me a bit of the uh, the anti-war protests during the mid two thousands, because you know I was active in that and marching against the war um and there were there were you know there'd be big protests in washington but there would also be smaller protests at state capitals and whatnot and what slowly started happening over the months and over the years is that more democratic politicians started to infiltrate those protests and give speeches and then it just kind of like became like uh democratic campaigns right and like that that led yeah. to the 2006 <laughs> 2008 elections and then um, yeah, you know, the, the occupations of, of Iraq and Afghanistan just con continued and there was never any prosecution of, of the Bush administration for war crimes or anything like that. And a lot of activists like Cindy Sheehan just got like thrown by the curb side. So, um, yeah, it is it is reminiscent of that. And honestly, another thing, too, that I kind of worry about is that when we see uh, you know unionization efforts like what happened at Amazon, 
you know, that that's all well and good. But then you start seeing people like brought to the White House, like what is what is kind of happening there? So, um, yeah, I, I definitely agree. And uh, Courtney and Keisha, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, just the, the fact that, you know, it, it seems as though historically the Democratic Party really does kind of take over these grassroots movement and co-opt them and then neuter them, really, <laughs> and just, uh, you know, bring all those people into the fold um, and to, to stop really being true grassroots activists. Yeah, I mean, um, we've it's so interesting because we've been working with Lucy on um, something that we're organizing, and I feel like she's kind of um, taught us a little bit about this and how this actually tends to happen. And it's a really good thing to be on the lookout for because um, actually, I kind of just did a video about this too about so many people kind yeah. of squashing that energy. Um, I mean, it, it's very difficult, you know, because it, in America, we have such an obsession with celebrity and we don't we don't trust one another. So of course, if, you know, someone big wants to come to your effort, at some point you're like, oh, that might be good. That might get me some sort of extra, uh, you know, eyes on this. But then, yeah, ultimately nothing ever ends up happening. And so um, I, I think uh, last week, you know, a lot of people were really concerned about, you know, Chris Smalls going to the White House and then Biden coming in for an impromptu mm -hmm. photo shoot, even though it was the same day that he also confirmed a 10, you know, 10, billion dollar contract, I think, um, for Amazon. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that a lot more people, and especially with social media, a lot more of us are seeing it. You know, I think, I think with, with a lot of the movements you all were talking about, even back in the day, we, we couldn't actually kind of explain what was happening. And, and sometimes that makes you seem like you might not be trustworthy, even right. though you're trying to look out for the betterment of the organization. Um, and I think that the celebritification of everything and, and how politicians now are such celebrities, that really blinds a lot of people. And so what Lucy was saying, like getting back to the roots of, um, you know, yeah, I mean, and it, it really does make it so difficult to even plan any sort of action as well, because it's like, you know, yeah, like you're saying, Lucy, like people want to go to your website and they want to see what you got going. It's like, OK, great. But I have to have somebody to run the website and somebody to run the Twitter and somebody to run some money some, and some money to, you know, buy the tents and do the things. So. Um, you know, we really, God, we just really have to, honestly, my mind was blown because you know what, we were at that student debt strike. And at first I thought like, oh, Nina Turner's here. Like, that's probably a good thing, but you're right. Like, what has Nina Turner done? Nothing. So like, what is she doing there? Like, yeah, we, I mean. But on the other hand, we made a video about it and we live streamed about it. And the more people watched when we put Nina Turner's part in it. Right. So it, it's it really a, a catch yeah. 22, but mm -hmm. I think, you know, um, having that kind of integrity to your, uh, the cause. Like, I, I really also like the way that Lucy's pointing out. I mean, almost even different issues have different sets of, of the way that we, we need to operate. So like, if we're focusing mm -hmm. on student debt, that is an issue that affects everybody, you know, kind of the same when we look at workers' rights, you know, we right. can't make this a left right issue. We have to be able to come together on that. Um, but then, you know, when you've got something like, leftists issues obviously we need to look through that through a different lens because we're talking about maybe different things but um i think if we're going to actually build we have to be able to not be distracted sometimes by other purity tests or i mean we're, we're just not going to always agree but we if we can focus on one issue that's really where we can build our power and i think the distraction is easy to come in because oftentimes as two as leftists we are looking to build a wide tent and we also are looking right. to make sure that we're you know taking care of people and not putting people in a dangerous situation so it's it's really is a balance and so it, it can really muddy the waters with mm -hmm. infiltrators so i believe that you two also uh, had some information that you wanted to share today or a slideshow presentation correct yes if Indeed. that's okay <laughs> yes so lucy Absolutely. kind of did an awesome what segue great earlier segue. Gosh, lucy wow just killing it love it um yeah, so we're working with Lucy right now and uh, some other great organizers, which just really grassroots organizers. Um, basically, a group of us were on a live stream a few months ago and we were talking about healthcare and, um, oh, it's okay. We were talking about healthcare and we were really just, I think, frustrated with the fact that, okay, we could plan another March in DC, I guess. And, you know, Lucy had this amazing idea where she said, maybe we go to the Hamptons because instead of um, bothering people who are, you know, just trying to get to work to DC, usually the lawmakers aren't actually there. 
um, you know, it would be best to actually go where they try to relax or the rich people who own all these corporations actually live. Yeah. Um, so it was a, such a badass idea. And like, we were off to the races with that. Ran yeah. with it. We were like, you know what? This sounds great. Um, yeah. So we, um, we partnered up with a couple of other, um, other people, you know, like from leftist Twitter, um, you know, different podcasters and the like, and, um, and, and honestly just, you know, just normal people too. I mean, we're not trying to make this some kind of like a weird, you know, podcasters only thing. We really want to get, um, some normal people, especially people who've never been camping. I think that would be great. Um, so the name of the action is Camp Dada. We're, we're going camping. Leftists are going camping. That's, that's the gist of it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to be there for quite, for, um, for, for a few days yeah, a few and days. each day is going to have a different focus so first day we're going to talk about uh health care the next day the climate crisis and the last day which will be labor day will be the general strike and basically what we want we want to focus for each day because we'd like to have some sort of demonstrations um uh which which are secret <laughs> if you want to know please join um and uh <laughs> we also want to have mirrored action so uh as lucy was saying before about the debt collective they did um an action when they did their action in DC that we were at, they also encouraged people to put on like a red piece of duct tape and put their amount of student debt on there. So that mm -hmm. way more people could hear about the action. Um, and we also want to have like speakers and discussions focused on these things each day. So those three are the main topics. Um, so yeah, we're going to do a lot of um, skill sharing. A lot of people are, are coming with, you know, like technical skills, you know, how to you know, cloak yourself if you're going to a rally and you don't want the government following you and like, uh, you know, interesting things that, um, you know, how to unionize your, the actual place where you work currently. Um, so we're going to try to do some things that will be um, very timely and useful to all of us. Um, a huge part of it too is just going to be us, you know, having fun because we're poor people and we're in rich people's spaces. Um, so, you know, it'll be mis mischievous fun, but <laughs> it's going to be something interesting um okay this is about our budget and all of that and which is kind of interesting when we're talking about like um people having infiltrators and in the left not really trusting and all of that stuff that's actually um, one of the questions i was just <laughs> marking down here to ask you how much yeah so yeah. We, we figured it would be thirteen thousand total but what we're really doing is looking to get grassroots just i mean it's everybody pulling in all together so uh, so far we've already even had somebody like donate a van so we we're not we're hoping that people can you know donate tents or help us purchase tents with um, like an Amazon wish list that we have and um, and those kind of items like tents sleeping bags things like that we're gonna donate to the unhoused neighbors in New York after the event um, so it should be like a really good paying it forward community building event overall and if we have any other funds you know we'll give those to strike funds or to um, people who are trying to unionize and I think one of the things that that we um, always try to mention with this is uh, court made a really good point about um, you know people on the right always getting together and always being at rallies and always having something to do always even on a local level talking to each other you know so um, people on the left really need to start just like meeting each other in person so we can actually trust each other. And when you give some mutual aid, you know who you're giving it to. So this is just the beginning of that. Um, so a couple skills that we need, uh, if anybody has these skills, um, we're looking for, um, we have some cooks, but you know, we definitely need some more camp cooks. Um, we want to have a really strong like uh, photography and video portion because we're going to be remote. So we won't be able to live stream. So we just want to be able to kind of document everything that we're doing. Um, and then some people to kind of like watch over the camp and babysit dogs and fun stuff like that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we're looking, it's gonna, it's, so it's a pretty small amount of, it's only 56 people can go total um, due to the budget. Um, maybe if we had a wealthy investor, yeah. maybe a lot more people could go. Um, but the way that we're kind of remedying that is we are also gonna make a virtual portion uh, where people can kind of hashtag camp data and we're going to share stories about why we still all need universal health care why you know how the climate crisis is impacting people right now you know a lot of people losing their homes becoming climate refugees seeing um, tornadoes for the first time yeah um and we also you know want to encourage people to tell us about you know their stories about work and stuff as well so um that's our house phone. sorry that's sorry. our house phone we're always calling our parents um, yeah, so you guys can DM us at Info Change Camp. We have a Twitter, just look for Camp Dada. Um, also, you can look up what Dadaism is. It's kind of like an art and political movement 
in one mm -hmm. um, and Dada means nothing, which is another reason why we wanted to go with it because even though we all are leftists, we've got anarchists, we've got, you know, hardcore socialists, we've got all kinds of different uh, viewpoints, but people who consider themselves on the left, like anti-imperialists and, you know, looking for universal health care and these kind of things. And we want to have, a, I think, a diverse, a diverse amount of uh, beliefs and, mm -hmm. and all of these things so we can have really good uh, discussions uh, for our fireside chats. So if you are interested, reach us out on Twitter at Info Change Camp or look up Camp Dada. You can check out our Give Butter is there. Um, you know, you can sponsor a whole campsite, sponsor a camper. Some, a lot of these will be people who, hopefully people who haven't gone. Um, or you can directly purchase something on our wish list, like a tent or like a fire bowl that will help yeah. us stay warm Flashlight. while we're there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the general idea. And the whole spirit of it is really just to unite the left and find things that we can be doing right now. Mm -hmm. It might seem like a really, really small action, but a lot, well, a lot of the people that we have are almost anonymous on Twitter, yeah. which is interesting. Um, or they can't, uh, they can't get involved because uh, they work at a nursing home and they're the only one there who thinks the way that they do. There's a lot of people who are very, um, you know, secluded isolated. and isolated. Mm -hmm. And I think that the left, we've got to draw people together and let them know that they're supported. And um, especially with what's going on with inflation and all kinds of things, you just want to have a good amount of community. And, and that's what we're trying to do. So again, you, you mentioned uh, the threat of infiltration. And, uh, you know, that's something that I think kind of happened a bit with, with Occupy Wall Street. Um, or I'm, I'm in Connecticut, and my buddy was involved with Occupy Hartford. And he seemed to think that, you know, some people were there either, uh, you know, at, like actively disrupting or, you know, even, even not maybe purposely, like just people kind of latched onto it and, and uh, ended up disrupting it. Um, and then like also like I've been involved with like independent media groups at the time where like they've had just people come and like completely overtake the conversation and try to like steer it in a weird you know, direction that had nothing to do with the, the original mission of, of the group. So again, how, how are you going to kind of avoid that and, and uh, be on guard for anybody trying to, to disrupt what you folks are organizing? Well, first of all, you know, one thing that I saw, we've, we've had a, a few issues with this thus far. And one thing that I saw a person say was like, I thought that people on the left were supposed to be nice and all of this stuff. Don't get the fact that I want things for the greater good mixed up with the fact that I will smack you down if you're trying to do something, which is one. Like, I feel like there should be a little bit of people being afraid. But I think it's, it's we, we have a lot of discussions and we... I just demand that all of us be very, very honest with how we're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, Lucy's got, you know, she's got her eye on the pulse with so yeah. many things that we should, because she's been involved in so many organizations and because she's so passionate. Um, and I think that one thing that's working for us now is like, there's no tr like one person who's truly involved. And so we really try to value each charge. other's, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> in charge. So we really try to value each other's opinions and, um, yeah, I mean, we're trying to, you know, as people are, you know, being basically, of the, uh, thus far, we we haven't had maybe just one person who's like DM'd us and said, hey, you know, I'm interested, or um, a couple. So we're trying to, you know, have these face-to-face -face Zoom calls with people and vet them as much as possible. Um, we are a large group, the little steering committee. We're a fairly big group, so, you know, we ask around and, like, see if other people have had problems with this person. Um, which has certainly come back to bite us in the ass later in the fact. Um, so we, we're learning as we go. Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, sometimes conversations do go, you know, way out of line and it's very confusing. And, you know, it's hard to tell what pe which people are being genuine and just really have concerns that they want to talk about, um, you know, and who's like, you know, trying to muddy the water. So we're just trying to like keep pushing forward, I think is the best <laughs> like yeah. plow right through it and then and in like, terms um sorry go ahead. they're like um like one of the rules that we have and by the way like any organization can be infiltrated but i think it's like two things one is that like we tried to do a rule where it's like no retweeting any politicians so yes like you know there might be like people involved that i don't know like you you can't tell a hundred percent that things won't get infiltrated but if you at least have some ground rules like we're not going to retweet politicians. We're gonna not going to take sides in like the political conversation in that sense. I think that's helpful. Um, the second thing is that like it would be really great, um, like what Keisha and Courtney said about how to. Like, part of what we're trying to do isn't really just like um, 
like direct people to this action, but to encourage people to camp other people, to have their own events, to have, you know what I mean, to decentralize and um, to have their own events um, where they actually make those personal connections with each other. And um, for student debt specifically, like um, when I was talking to Alan, um, he said, you know, I think that we should just have everyone do an action on from home where they're just burning, where they're just burning their debt on video. Um, or, you know, like anything like that to make people feel connected. Um, and it would be great if people that are watching this show had ideas for actions. Um, because like part of this came through just like a conversation with multiple people brainstorming. And I think that if people that were actually in the audience gave us some more ideas of how to brainstorm, it would also lead to it being like a more decentralized effort because decentralized efforts are much harder to co-opt. If, if you like put like so much effort into one um, idea, one like one event, um, and then you expect everything from it. We're not trying to do that. All we're trying to do is kind of like foster connections with each other so that we can get more ideas, like get more ideas from each other. Like, how are we going to um, make the connections that we need to get out of these problems? Because we have a lot of problems that we're facing and student debt is just one of them. Um, I also think that like know. the support system that we have too is very diverse. Um, and so like we've got Savvy Sabs coming, people from Revolutionary Blackout Network. We've got Socialist Alternative people supporting. We've got Green Party people coming and supporting. You know, we're trying to, Assange, Occupy, yeah, Assange yeah. people, Occupy people, um, but also the people who can't come, they're also helping us recruit as well. And so I think one thing that uh, one thing that's been a hindrance, I guess, on the left is that, I, and I, the reason I bring up being kind is that the person that we we did have an issue with, many, many, many other people messaged me after the fact to say that they had an issue with this person. But, and I'm talking about people like who worked in parties and stuff together, and they were mm -hmm. like, "Oh, I just didn't want to tell you. I thought maybe you're friends with them." That's not helpful, you know. If we know on the left that somebody's doing something that can be detrimental to movements or, or is putting people, putting our comrades in dangerous situations for no reason and, you know, kind of just weird behavior. Um, these are things that we should be talking about. And I, I know it's um, difficult. I'm, I'm saying this to myself as I probably should be saying it too. Uh, but, you know, I think that it's important that on the left, you know, we don't get so caught up in the fact that, yes, we are trying to work for the greater good and make sure that we're kind, good people, but we also have to make sure we stand firmly in calling out people who are trying to hurt us. Um, you know, because I ask the same things for our politicians. Like, it makes me really mad that AOC and, and on the squad won't say who would vote a certain way or who would vote this way, like name the name. So I think that honesty is, is going to be the best way to, to combat any kind of infiltration. And then just in terms of the legal side of it, as far as uh, having, you know, renting this camp space, like, are you allowed to like do political organizing there? Or do you have any concerns about like police giving you a hard time? Um, our goal is not to be arrested. Um, <laughs> we do not have any plans of doing anything illegal. Um, we actually, um, there's um, a person on the team who is a lawyer. And so, you know, we send questions and we say, what if we did this? Would that be illegal? Can you look it up? So, um, you know, we're trying to stay within the law as much as possible. And honestly, like, um, you know, Dadaism is a form of art too. So we are trying to do a lot of like, you know, kind of like artsy fartsy types of demonstrations that will hopefully get their attention, but also, you know, be, be really impactful and either impact them or bother them one or the other. Um, but, you know, we're, tr we're trying to take as many precautions as we can on the front side, you know, even the way we're booking the campsites and stuff um, as much as as much as possible. We have a strong team of white ladies helping us book the yeah, campsites. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So, like, when there's an issue, you know, the white ladies will go to the front and they can they can talk. <laughs> them, so. And they're cool with that. They were they, like, that's what we can do. They've already agreed to, to be it. Yeah. So, if you are a white woman who likes to talk to the police, even though I don't think we'll have any issues, we're going to have a lot of cleanup crews we're not going to be loud or anything yeah. um but if you know if yeah we can use some more white ladies please use. let us know yeah and so this is labor day weekend labor day yeah. weekend mm -hmm. yeah okay and is there a deadline for people to sign up just before it fills up so ooh, yeah you better um, get in there fast <laughs> <laughs> um, uh yeah we're about like halfway probably full yeah, right now right. so um and, it, and it's uh, like also depending on like money and if people can get campsites because it's it's just all very you know 
this buyer bootstraps, as I like to say. The one yeah. <laughs> Well, it does, uh, it does sound exciting. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, it, you're right too, for people to kind of organize uh, at a grassroots level and, and kind of, you know, do things in, in literally their own backyard or you know, in their own hometowns with people who they know. So um, hopefully the, the idea does spread. Um, I do have uh, one patron question for you. Uh, and Lucy, this actually kind of goes to what you were speaking to earlier. Uh, this question is from John McCarthy in Chicago. John writes, just uh, just allowing student loans to be dischargeable in bankruptcy would make a big difference. Why is nobody proposing this as a solution? So um, most of the student loan activists are proposing this as, as a solution. The people that like really understand the issue. Um, the reason the Democrats aren't proposing it as a solution is because um, really what's convenient for the financial system is to forgive um, a certain amount of debt up to a certain, a very low cap. So that like $10,000 figure that Biden keeps citing, it's basically like a little drop in the bucket. It doesn't even make up, uh, cover most people's interests. Um, so like, uh, this is what they want because what they want is they want to keep the financial system going the way it is. And they, they basically buy and sell debt um, you know, like if you buy stocks online, you can buy like Navient stocks or, you know, like someone's debt is someone else's asset. Um, so they want to keep the system of buying and selling debt. That's what's convenient for the banks. Um, and um, that, that really won't be affected by forgiving up to a certain ceiling of debt. If you allow um, debt to be discharged through bankruptcy without even, um, without even forgiving student debt, which people don't really talk about, what's going to happen is a whole lot of people are going to file from bankruptcy and people in this country are going to find out how many people in this country are bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so like, this is not a narrative that is convenient for either political party. Imagine being a po the political party in office as everyone in the country, 45 million people are filing for bankruptcy. This would be like a complete um, game changer, like it would ruin them <laughs> for the next five electoral cycles. So none of them want to do this. Um, they don't want any action on this. They don't want people to file to, to, to get their bankruptcy, like constitutional rights back. Um, what they want is for people to just sit at home. They want to keep extending it until the other party has to deal with it. Um, that's always convenient for them to just like extend and push the, you know, um, how do you say, like push the bucket along or... <laughs> And that's what they want to do. And if there's any way that we can like creatively combat this, I feel like I feel like one of the things that we have to realize is that we don't have to rework the wheel. Like other countries have dealt with this problem. Like I, I posted a, a link to an article um, I wrote on Chile's student debt crisis, and they actually fought for free college and they got free college. Um, and they had a very similar system to us. Um, which was very much based on student debt. Like they had to, um, not as much as here, but they had a lot of student, they had like a student debt crisis. Did they forgive the, the student loan debt or did they just make college free? They made college free. And um, they also forgave, I don't, I'm, I'm not positive about forgiving all the student debt, but they had, they basically, the student debt movement in Chile was basically one of the biggest things that led to their current third party. So they had also had like a 30, third party win um, that broke from their original two parties. And part of the, one of the movements that was the biggest contributors to that um, was the student debt movement. So like student debt is an incredibly important issue because it like unites people of different, from different states, different ideologies, different races. You know, it's an ex extremely uniting issue. Um, they don't want people to see this. It's very convenient for the establishment um, to for people to think like, oh, this is a democratic issue, or this is like, you know, it's not a Republican issue right now, but they don't want people to think about it even as bankruptcy as a constitutional right. So that's that's mm -hmm. part of why um, I'm very suspicious when I see student debt groups, maybe because I've also like really studied up on this, you know, and, and not everyone might be totally aware of it. But I'm very suspicious when I see a student debt group um, retweeting politicians, framing it in a way that's only appealing to Democrats, because I know that that's not going to benefit us. 
And by the way, if the Republicans win the House and Senate in November, we're going to have to keep pushing for this when the Republicans are in office. So we should probably start framing it in a way that's appealing to both parties, like people from both parties right now. Um, because if we once we lose the House and Senate, we won't even be able to pressure Democrats anymore. So like that's that's where my mind is, and I don't really care about the parties anymore. I don't even vote anymore, and I've stopped caring about all of them. <laughs> well, uh, just last question. I mean, when you talk about the debt being traded, the student loan debt being traded, um, you know, I, I asked previously about if the loan payments resume, would that cause an economic crash? But if the debt does get for forgiven, um, doesn't that kind of uh, doesn't that kind of undermine how this debt is being traded or, you know, get, get rid of that debt so they can't even trade that anymore? Is it possible that that may cause an eco economic downturn in itself just for giving the debt? No. Um, and the reason for that is because the debt has already been forgiven. Um, like this is part of what people don't understand that like during the Obama administration, during the bank bailouts, um, uh, the United States government under Obama um, actually made it risk-free for banks to lend people money to go to college by guaranteeing, guaranteeing those loans. So most student loans, like 95% of student loans are federally backed, which means all of the creditors took no risk. And when people started defaulting on their student loans, which a, lar a, lar a large number of people are actually already in default, um, and a large number of people are actually even already on strike. Um, uh, when, when, when that happened, um, those creditors already got a bailout from the federal government. So basically the banks already got a bailout for your student loans. You're the only one that hasn't gotten a bailout. And, and by the way, like at least a third of um, the government's budget is student loans, is what people are paying back in student loans. So it's not even coming directly from taxes. Like basically anyone that has student loan debt has an additional tax load. Um, and that's basically like a third of the federal budget. This, it's, this is like a crazy issue. It's like, <laughs> it's really like the stats on it are crazy. And, um, you know, like I can definitely refer other people that can come on to you to talk specifically about that in the future if you want. But just in general, I think like individually, I think it would be great personally, like, and I've talked about it with a few people to support actions like Camp Dada, try to connect it to other issues in people's minds. Um, and also to think of something that we can do individually that won't be co-opted. Like, is there some kind of like ice bucket challenge or something that we could do from our house to bring attention to student debt, like maybe burning the debt or, I don't know. Is there something that we could do like individually without being led by the nose by some nonprofit organization or having to sign up to some event? Like, mm -hmm. like I feel like we need to be a little bit more creative. Um, and, you know, I don't really know what we could do, but I think burning debt, that could be maybe one idea or going to more events. I don't know. I'm also like looking for feedback, you know? I love the burning the dead idea. Yeah. Just I'm concerned about people in apartments. You know, no, <laughs> do it and, outside and people with wigs. You know, but yeah, don't start a fire. But like, <laughs> yeah, but that's a good idea. That's a really cool idea. Well, I appreciate uh, all you folks coming on today and, and talking about this. You know, I think that at the very least, that's that's the first step is just uh, acknowledging it and again getting together on a grassroots level. And as you're saying, not being led by the politicians. That probably is the most important part. Um, but thanks again for everybody for coming on. I'd, I'd love to have all of you back on at some point in the future. And uh, Keisha and Courtney, uh, how can folks follow you and uh, support you? And how can they sign up for Camp Dada? Um, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is Bank Sisters. Um, I'm at one of these Keishas on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Courtney Banks on Twitter. And um, yeah, just look up Info Change Camp or just Camp Dada on Twitter. Our uh, Give Butter page is there and you can DM us or DM us personally if you are really interested in going and um, we'd like to have a chat with you first. Thank and Lucy, you for time. Th thank it's you. <laughs> thank you. Right. And uh, Lucy, how can folks uh, follow you and support you? Um, so I, I mean, I have a, 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 YouTube pa a YouTube page called Blue Moon Red Wine, um, but um, I, I don't post videos every day or anything like that, but I am on Twitter, BMRW Show. If you have ideas for actions, definitely get in touch, like tweet at me, 
or tweet at Camp Data and say, look, like I, you know, I have a really great idea um, of something that we can do. Um, like, like I, I would like to um, get this to be more of a two-way conversation. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, everybody. I really do appreciate it. And hopefully I can have you all back at some point in the future. Cool. Nice, nice, nice to meet you. Yeah. Good to see you, Lucy. Bye.